morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Brosco. I'm one of the uh, Development's Pediatricians and Associate Director of the Mailman Center for Child Development. I want to welcome you to our grand rounds. We are extraordinarily lucky to have Dr. Cynthia Powell come to visit with us this morning through Zoom. Before I tell you about Dr. Powell, I just want to remind everyone that our, our second main Mailman Center grand rounds this fall will be on October 22nd. We'll be inviting Dr. Manny Jimenez, a developmental behavioral pediatrician from New Jersey, who's going to talk about bilingual child development and the role of pediatrics in that. But today, we are extraordinarily lucky to have Dr. Cynthia Powell. She's a professor of pediatrics and genetics at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. She sees patients, she teaches students, residents, fellows, and participates in research. She's board certified as a clinical geneticist, cytogeneticist, pediatrician, and genetic counselor. Really extraordinary range of backgrounds. She did her pediatrics residency at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and medical genetics fellowship there and at the NIH. She has a whole range of leadership positions in genetics and newborn screening, most important of which right now is that she chairs the U.S. Federal Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. It's a federal advisory committee that most of us don't hear about too often, but actually sets policy for newborn screening in the United States and has huge influence internationally as well. I think it's, it's, it might be not an exaggeration to say that it's the single most important position in newborn screening just about anywhere in the world. And so we're very lucky to have Dr. Powell to talk to us today about newborn screening in general. I do have to tell you just quickly about her research because it's pertinent to what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And that is, she's interested in newborn screening, obviously, genomics and genetic syndromes. But in particular, she was the PI on a five-year NIH grant called NC Nexus which looked at the use of genetic sequencing, um, next-gen sequencing, in newborn screening. So again, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cindy Powell. It's great to have you come and talk to Cindy, and we look forward to a, an exciting view of the past, present, future of newborn screening. Thank you very much, Dr. Brasco. And let me just begin to share my screen here. And like that. hopefully everyone can see it OK. Um, so yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you today. I'm sorry we can't all be in person, but hopefully before too long. I don't have any financial disclosures. As Dr. Brasco said, I am the current chair of the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, but I'm not speaking today on behalf of the committee nor my role on that committee. I did want to give you an overview today um, regarding the history of newborn screening. How did we get to where we are now? Uh, what are some of the things that um, are on the horizon? Uh, what are the current conditions that we screen for? Uh, to think about uh, genomics and newborn screening, um, an area that I'm definitely interested in. And also, when we talk about newborn screening, we have to think about rare diseases. Um, the uh, objectives are, uh, at the end of this talk, to be able to identify two major discoveries that led to the development or expansion of newborn screening, to describe how the use of genomic sequencing may enable newborn screening for new conditions, and to name at least one ethical issue that arises when we think about utilizing genomic sequencing for all newborns. Um, and in the words of William Wordsworth, the English poet, let us learn from the past to profit by the present and from the present to live better in the future. So what is newborn screening? Um, it's a public health problem that's aimed at the early identification of conditions for which early and timely intervention can prevent or reduce mortality and morbidity. It's a system that's been called one of the greatest public health programs in the United States. Four million infants are screened each year in the US. And it's estimated that 12,000 babies have their lives saved or vastly improved because of newborn screening. We utilize criteria that's been adapted from Wilson and Youngner, who published in 1968 criteria for general types of screening. Um, and that is that treatment is available, that early institution of treatment before symptoms are manifest reduces or eliminates the severity of the illness, and that routine observation or examination will not reveal the disorder in a new 
in a newborn, you have to do a test, and that there is a rapid and accurate um, and economical laboratory test available. And we want that test to be as highly sensitive as possible because we don't want to miss any cases, but we also want it to be reasonably specific because we don't want to have uh, too many false positives. Newborn screening uh, consists of uh, different types of testing. Uh, the most common and the one that tests for the most conditions is the newborn blood spot done by a heel prick. And usually this is done or it's supposed to be done after the baby is 24 hours of age because there's certain conditions that you won't pick up if the testing is done too early. Um, and then you want to get it done um, before a child's discharge from the hospital. So usually it's done between 24, 72 hours. And then there are also point of care tests that are done as part of newborn screening. And that includes uh, doing a hearing test on all babies to check for congenital hearing loss. And that's done either through autoacoustic emission tests or evoked response testing as is shown in the, the baby here in the middle. And then finally, um, we've, we screen for critical congenital heart defects through doing a pulse oximetry. And with all this testing, approximately one in 150 infants will have a condition that's detected. Now, phenylketonuria, or PKU, is the first test that we started screening for in newborns back in the 1950s. And with this uh, condition, babies appear perfectly normal at birth, but if untreated, usually within a few months after birth, they develop delays. And the condition, if untreated, results in intellectual disability, often seizures, and uh, significant behavioral problems. In the picture, the boy on the left is an 11-year-old with untreated PKU and severe intellectual disability. And on the right is his healthy two-and-a-half-year-old sister who was treated with the appropriate diet, a low in phenylalanine, um, shortly after birth and is, uh, was normal. Now, how did we get to the point of being able to screen for PKU? In 1934, a Norwegian biochemist and physician, Dr. Ferling, published the description of PKU as a cause of what in those days was termed mental retardation, but we didn't know of any way to treat it. Because of uh, parent advocates, and Dr. Howell recently wrote a paper uh, that pointed out the value of uh, the family input. Um, and so uh, there were mothers of children with PKU who noticed that their children seemed to do better when they were on a low protein diet. And in around 1954, Horst Bickel, a German physician, discovered that yes, the effects of PKU could be prevented by a diet low in the amino acid phenylalanine. But then in order to do a large scale newborn screening, it wasn't until Dr. Robert Guthrie in 1963 uh, developed a method of um, bacterial inhibition assay uh, that could be done off of punches obtained through um, of the blood spot card. And um, the card itself is often termed the Guthrie card. And in 1963, Massachusetts and Oregon passed legislation to begin newborn screening. And in your state of Florida, legislation was passed shortly after that in 1965 that promoted uh, PKU screening. And nowadays, these are the typical outcomes of children who are picked up through newborn screening, um, confirmed they have PKU uh, started on the diet and are very healthy individuals and have um, lives that are are perfectly normal. Um, it is a challenge though to keep to the diet. And so there's some newer treatments that are becoming um, more in use um, to help with uh, having a more liberal diet and yet keeping phenylalanine levels low. And I always like to point out um, that newborn screening is not just the identification through the laboratory screen and the confirmation uh, of the condition. It's really lifelong. So the short-term follow-up is within the first few days or weeks of life. That includes 
obtaining the positive screen, doing confirmatory testing, if the diagnosis is confirmed, making sure that therapy is instituted. But then um, lifelong, uh, there needs to be ongoing medical management and surveillance. And this was pointed out early through um, PKU when uh, in the days when, when I first started in genetics, um, patients were often taken off the diet in later childhood. Um, it was realized that women with untreated PKU when they got pregnant um, were at very high risk for having children with significant problems that included intellectual disability, microcephaly, congenital heart defects, and this woman here um, was untreated during her pregnancies with these boys who all had uh, manifestations of maternal PKU. So they don't have PKU, they're all carriers for PKU, but they had the harmful effects because mom wasn't on a diet. So it's really critical that people stay on the diets ideally um, and uh, that women be on the appropriate diet prior to conception. That often doesn't happen, unfortunately, if they get on the diet, within the first few weeks of pregnancy, these problems can for the most part be avoided, but follow-up must be lifelong. And as I said, newborn screening is a system. So I like to put the patient and the family in the middle. It's important that they have a medical home with a primary care provider who's knowledgeable about their condition, um, but also uh, most patients receive specialist medical services, um, involvement with genetic counselors and metabolic dietitians, especially for, for those with inborn errors of metabolism where appropriate diet is critical. Um, and then access to therapy services, uh, specialized foods, community resources are um, also critical. And of course, the, the laboratory part is um, where it all starts. And looking at um, the early part, uh, early history of newborn screening in Florida, um, <clears throat> pretty much uh, followed what was being done in most states with PKU newborn screening started in the 1960s, mid 1960s, followed by other conditions um, up through 2005 when uh, biotinidase was added. Um, so. Beyond that, um, I wanted to talk about how we got to the current state of newborn screening um, so that uh, we can plan ahead for the future, but um, think about what's going on in present times. And um, part of this that's very important is the development of tandem mass spectrometry or MSMS. And this type of specialized um, biochemical analysis was recognized uh, by Dr. David Millington, who's a, a biochemical geneticist at Duke. Um, MSMS was being used in industry, but Dr. Millington recognized that it could be utilized to detect uh, metabolites in patients with inborn errors of metabolism. He collaborated with um, two of our faculty here at UNC, Dr. Joseph Munzer and Dr. Diane Frazier. And in North Carolina, we did a statewide pilot um, utilizing tandem mass spec to identify dozens of additional conditions that previously were impossible to, to test for through newborn screening. Uh, those included fatty acid oxidation disorders. Uh, the most common one of these is medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency or MCAD, a condition that leads to a severe hypoglycemia often if not treated. A third of patients with MCAD will develop a um, severe episode of hypoglycemia leading to death. A third will have an episode that um, leads to permanent uh, brain damage and intellectual disability. And for reasons that we still don't completely understand, a third will um, not have any serious sequelae from MCAD. Uh, but as long as babies are fed frequently um, and uh, patients continue to avoid uh, severe hypoglycemia, the um, problems of MCAD can be pre present prevented. There are also other uh, types of conditions, including organic acidemias and other amino acid disorders, in addition to PKU, such as maple syrup urine disease that can be detected through tandem mass spec. So some states were starting to utilize tandem mass spec, but others weren't. Um, in the early 2000s, it led to quite a lot of discrepancies from one state to another. Um, some states were screening for nine or more uh, conditions, whereas others only had maybe two or three conditions that they were screening for. 
This became obvious also in 2006, where there was continued big, big discrepancy with some states screening for more than 20 conditions and others um, very few. So um, because of these large discrepancies, um, HRSA funded a task force in 2005, and this was a contract to the American College of Medical Genetics that led to determining a um, set of conditions that should be screened for, re were, were recommended to be screened for in, in all states. And um, that was led by Dr. Rodney Howell, Dr. Michael Watson, and um, again, they pointed out that because of this large discrepancy among states, we really needed a uniform screening panel and system. And they looked at over 70 conditions and came up with, uh, they did a scoring metric and they came up with those that they recommended should be on the core panel. And um, I'll get back to that in a little bit later on. But um, with those recommendations, um, more states were using tandem mass spec. And so uh, most states uh, by 2006, I think it was, um, or 2009, were screening for um, most of, of these core conditions. At that time, it was 29 core conditions that were screened for. So this ultimately led to the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. And um, this is an advisory committee that advises the Secretary of the US Department of Health and Ser Human Services on the most appropriate application of universal newborn screening tests. Um, also can advise on other policies and guidelines regarding uh, conditions in, in children, affecting children. And this is the history of the advisory committee. Um, the secretary approved the, uh, formally approved the ACMG panel and the RUS was established in 2010. Since the committee was established, other conditions have been added that include severe combined immunodeficiency, the critical congenital heart disease, uh, Pompe disease, MPS1 or Hurler syndrome, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, dystrophy, and the last condition added was spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, the committee is authorized under the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act that was first um, enacted in 2007. It was reauthorized in 2014. Unfortunately, it was not reauthorized in 2019 because of failure to pass the Senate, and it's still not been reauthorized so that we function as a discretionary advisory committee and unfortunately lost a couple of valuable members when we had to switch over um, as a discretionary advisory committee. But um, the majority of our work still continues. Um, as I said, uh, the uh, Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act has not uh, been reauthorized and this is a link to some information about that. So how does the committee undergo uh, making a decision about whether or not a new condition uh, should be added. This uh, work was published in 2014 um, with Dr. Alex Kemper and Dr. Joseph Bocchini, who was the chair of the advisory committee at that time. And um, it basically breaks it down into two areas. The net benefit to the population of newborns screened. Is there high or at least moderate certainty that screening for the targeted condition will lead to significant benefit? And also what's the state's capability to offer this screening? Um, are most state laboratories uh, ready for screening or at least have developmental readiness to provide this screening? And so these are two of the things among others that the committee really uh, considers when they're, uh, before they vote um, on whether or not to recommend a, a condition for the recommended uniform screening panel or RUS. There we go. So um, there's an in-depth evidence-based review that's done before the committee votes on a new condition. Um, this is uh, has to be done within nine months. Uh, that was enacted a few years ago because it was thought that the whole process took too long to add a new condition. 
So once um, the committee has an initial vote on whether or not to move a condition to evidence-based review, then an outside group um, also funded by HRSA does a very in-depth analysis um, and looks at a lot of different metrics regarding this new condition and how much evidence is available. If the committee recommends that a condition be added to the RUSC, this goes to the secretary um, for final approval. The secretary may ask for additional information, may not approve it, or may approve it. Um, if the secretary approves it, this is a recommendation. It's not a mandate. It's up to individual states whether or not to add that condition to their own newborn screening panel. Some states um, have laws now that say that any condition on the rust, they have to start screening for within a certain period of time. Other states don't have that, so they can decide whether or not they want to add the condition. And states also can add conditions that are not on the rust. These are the current 35 core conditions that are on the rust. And um, there are also 26 secondary conditions that are conditions that will also be detected while screening for the core conditions. Um, as I mentioned, the, the most um, recent condition um, is spinal muscular atrophy. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Another of the more recent conditions added is X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. This primarily affects males, about one in 15 to 20,000 males. Um, males who are detected early and get treatment typically with um, stem cell transplants, bone marrow transplants early enough um, can uh, avoid uh, the situation of um, becoming permanently disabled um, due to a, a late diagnosis. We always have to remember that um, there's family needs when we expand newborn screening. This was the case when we first started screening for PKU, but I always think it's important to, to point out. And um, I've, I've liked this quote that um, the experience gained over the past 30 years uh, with screening for PKU shows that the time elapsing between the first alarm signal and the onset of care remains permanently engraved in the parent's memory and that blunders committed in word or deed will never be forgotten. And um, there are many anecdotes about families who have gotten contacted by a primary care doctor who may have said like, oh, the PKU test was abnormal. You need to call such and such a person, you know, to find out about this. And it's really important that that primary care provider be able to be accurate. Often it's not PKU at all. It's one of the other conditions for which the screen has been um, abnormal or leading to a referral. That doesn't necessarily mean that the child's affected with that condition. Confirmatory testing is needed. Sometimes the testing is just borderline results, so like another blood spot card is needed. Uh, sometimes it's in the definite, you know, looks like high likelihood that the child's affected, and they need to be seen quickly for most of these conditions. But um, there are act sheets available um, through the American College of Medical Genetics that are great for primary care providers, um, often uh, given out by the state newborn screening people um, so that the primary care doc um, or nurse practitioner, whoever's going to call those parents, has some basic information like what's the abnormality, what's this condition, what needs to be done next. You know, you will be talking to someone with expertise about this, you know, within a few days um, and uh, here's some basic information that you can have. Um, and that that's really important. Um, the other thing is that um, in terms of the follow-up care, uh, public health benefits and better outcomes through newborn screening programs are only realized if there's adequate resources for long-term follow-up care and management. And that's often very difficult. Um, in our own state, uh, the uh, fee that's charged for the newborn screening testing really only goes to the state public health laboratory, which is critical, but it doesn't fund any of the follow-up programs for newborn screening. And Susan Berry, a colleague in um, genetics at the University of Minnesota, stated that newborn screening is only as effective as the care it prompts. 
So I wanted to uh, take a minute to talk about a spinal muscular atrophy, just so you can get an appreciation for some of the recent wonderful progress that's been made in treatment for rare conditions. Um, and as I mentioned, it was most recently added to the rust. It's an autosomal recessive condition. It's due to deficiency of the survival motor neuron protein. It results in progressive degeneration and irreversible loss of the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord and brainstem nuclei. The onset of weakness varies um, in the most severe type uh, type 1 SMA. Um, it presents usually at a few months or few weeks of life uh, with uh, weakness noted in the baby. Um, they stop moving their legs. They maybe don't move their hands up to their mouths anymore as they used to, um, but their brain is, is perfectly normal. They typically have this amazing bright bright eyes, you know, extremely alert, but just um, begin to stop moving. Most individuals have a deletion in exon 7 within the SMN1 gene, um, and a few cases, 5% are due to having heterozygosity um, with one uh, copy of the gene having the deletion, the other type having an intragenic mutation. That's important because um, most newborn screening will, will not pick up these 5% of cases. So if you ever suspect that a patient patient has SMA and they had normal newborn screening, you still want to do additional testing to check for this other possibility. Um, one of the treatments that we use is really based on this backup gene that, that's uh, present. Um, it's called SMN2. It's near the SMN1 gene, but it um, can uh, sort of modify the disease severity in that the more SMN2 copy numbers you have, it's usually associated with um, somewhat less severe symptoms. That's not the case 100% of the time. Um, there's also other rare forms of spinal muscular atrophy due to different genes. Um, the signs and symptoms, as I said, muscle weakness, um, is common, um, but really in children, uh, the most severe uh, problems develop due to the fact that they their uh, muscles uh, controlling their breathing um, don't function. And ultimately, that leads to respiratory failure and death unless they're put on um, respiratory support. Um, without treatment, uh, they do develop debilitating atrophy. Uh, but Fortunately, there are recent FDA-approved therapies. The first one that we had was an intrathecal drug, so it has to be infused into the spinal cord, so essentially doing a lumbar puncture um, on a patient um, and uh, delivering the drug that way. This is an antisense oligonucleotide that works on modulation, so sort of ramping up this SMN2 uh, copy. Um, and then uh, subsequently gene therapy was developed and has now been FDA approved. Uh, this is Zolgensma and um, this is a one-off therapy. So in many respects, much easier on patients because they can get gene therapy and not have to go through the, um, the monthly or every few months um, Spinraza treatment. And then uh, an oral drug has been approved now. Um, I know that uh, there's some question of how effective it is. It's also only been approved, I think it's three months of age is the youngest, so you really can't start treating after birth, but it may be a, an important supplement to other treatments. And there's other therapies that are under investigation. Um, currently, treatment either with Spinraza lifelong or gene therapy is $2 million per child. And um, better than my description is this recent um, video, and I'm going to try to play that for you now. Who knew that these children could have a future different than what, what the diagnosis says? Jennifer Lee and her husband Shane know all about how quickly SMA can ruin a child's muscles. And their ability to stand, eat, and even breathe on their own. Their first child, Jocelyn, was diagnosed with SMA four months after she was born in 2007, but it was already too late. We were told, take them home and love them, that you're not going to have them forever. SMA stole Jocelyn's life four years later. The Lee's second child, Trey, was just a year old. He doesn't have SMA, but he is a carrier. And then came Nathan two years later, and once again, 
an SMA diagnosis. He is dependent on the BiPAP to breathe. He has a heat pump. Asher, who was born two years after Nathan, is an SMA carrier, but free of the actual disease. His four-year-old sister, Kira, however, has SMA. Fortunately, just months before she was born, a trial drug was green-lighted by the FDA. It worked so well, it now has full approval. Being dosed at 11 days, she's still to this day, turned four in March, not showing any symptoms of SMA. She's running, skipping, jumping. She's riding a bike with no training wheels already. The same is true for her 19-month-old sister, Jessa, who has SMA and was given the therapy drug at seven days old. The drug has also helped prolong Nathan's life. So um, in the past, before newborn screening for SMA, we could only identify at-risk children um, because of their family history. Um, whereas now um, in 38 states that are currently screening for SMA, we are able to uh, diagnose it at a much earlier age and start most children within the first two weeks of life um, when they are affected. There are some challenges. You have to get insurance authorization or Medicaid authorization, which can delay things somewhat but um, things seem to be working well in the majority of states. And it's estimated that 85% of babies are now screened in the US for SMA. So in um, Florida, uh, the uh, tandem mass spectrometry testing was begun in 2006, which added at that time 25 and more new conditions that could be screened for, um, followed by cystic fibrosis and, and the other um, conditions. So um, that's where we are now. Um, what do we, what are we going to do in the future? What's on the horizon? The best way to predict the future is to create it. And um, in thinking about this, um, we need to consider uh, most of the conditions um, that are screened for in newborns, um, with the exception maybe of critical congenital heart disease and hearing loss are rare conditions. Um, for example, for PKU, one in 13,500 to one in 15,000 children are um, affected with PKU. So uh, the definition in the US is that a uh, rare disease is one that affects fewer than 200,000 people. In the European Union, they use the definition that it affects fewer than one in 2,000 people. Um, but it's estimated that there are from seven to 9,000 rare diseases in, um, uh, in existence. And um, many of these, not all, are genetic. At least half affect children. It's estimated that 25 to 30 million people in the US have a rare disease. So taken individually, they're rare. But as a whole, they're not so rare. And one in 10 individuals is estimated as having a rare disease. So could we be screening newborns for more rare diseases? Well, one of the limitations is that um, we talked about the importance that there be a beneficial treatment, and many of these conditions still don't have a treatment. If we look at um, the database online Mendelian inheritance in man, we look at the number of new genetic conditions that have been identified. Um, the dark bars are those uh, phenotypes with a known molecular basis, so a known genetic cause. Um, and it was close to 7,000 um, this year. Um, however, in the green are those disorders with treatment, only about 500 currently have an existing treatment available. However, there are uh, many clinical trials, drug development uh, going on, um, and also some drugs that are uh, being um, put forth to the FDA for approval. Um, so more than 450 of those at least. Um, so there is a promise um, and especially with improvements in gene therapy, um, some of those um, oligonucleotide types of uh, treatments, um, there's thought to be a very rapid pace on the horizon for new abilities to treat conditions. Um, another problem with being able to expand newborn screening is that we've had no screening test available. And going back to the work of Dr. Howell's group in the um, mid-2000s, 
Um, as I said, they you know, pointed out the ones that were important to add at that time, but a lot of conditions were eliminated because there was no test available. About a third of the conditions that they considered um, were excluded because there was no test available. However, now uh, 23 of those, of those 23 conditions at that time, 21 are detectable in some or all cases with molecular genetic analyses. And um, we got to that point uh, through somewhat through um, being able to do this on a higher throughput basis with next generation sequencing, also called a massively parallel sequencing. Basically, you only need to have a DNA sample from a patient um, and the sequencing can be done within a few hours. The analysis takes a bit longer. However, um, the fastest um, timing for results using next generation sequencing is held by Dr. Stephen Kingsmore um, out in, uh, at the University of California, San Diego. And um, he's done it within 24 hours. Um, so there is a rapid high throughput that um, is being utilized now, mostly for critically ill newborns, is um, where we utilize rapid uh, whole exome or whole genome sequencing. So barriers to adding any disorder to a newborn screening panel can be overcome if there's a known genetic etiology established for that condition. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about should we be doing this? Should we be doing whole exome or genome sequencing on babies? Um, thinking about how uh, the pace of being able to add conditions has progressed, we talked about with um, institution of tandem mass spec, um, that greatly increased the number of conditions um, on a logarithmic scale. Theoretically, with genome scale sequencing, we could test for thousands of different single gene disorders. There are benefits that have been proven already for utilizing uh, next generation sequencing um, at the state uh, newborn screening lab level. This is primarily with just sequencing single genes. As an example, um, with CF newborn screening, um, you're often left with a newborn who's screened positive and has only one um, CFTR gene uh, mutation. Uh, that's been found. Um, that's usually through looking for the more common mutations within the CFTR gene, which can have over 400 different mutations that have been reported. Um, so a couple of states, at least now, um, California, New York State, are utilizing a third term, a third tier of testing in CF newborn screening that sequences the entire CFTR gene. And that can cut down on the number of children who are screen positive and have to go in for more definitive testing with um, the uh, sweat testing. Um, also, it can help uh, with more specific delineation of what's the exact problem. Um, with severe combined immunodeficiency, we know that many different immunodeficiency conditions can be detected through the newborn screening test, um, but it doesn't tell you precisely what's the condition which can is needed in order to know, like, does the child need an immediate bone marrow transplant or are there other treatment options available? Um, also, similarly, hearing loss. Um, where we detect hearing loss in the child. We don't know if this is due to an early um, in utero infection or if it's due to a syndromic cause of hearing loss, in which case there might be other problems such as vision loss in the future, or is it um, a non-syndromic single gene type of hearing loss? So doing expanded panels for those genes um, is being done on a research basis now in some laboratories. Um, and then potentially we could screen for a lot of additional conditions, as I said, that would include cancer predisposition syndromes, serious childhood onset conditions um, for which treatment is available, um, such as some of the uh, congenital thyroid or early onset thyroid cancer um, conditions due to the RET gene. But we definitely need more studies to assess the clinical utility of this. Uh, challenges include the long turnaround time, um, but again, that's getting better. The cost is certainly still prohibitive to be done on a public health basis, but the cost is coming down. 
Um, also, if we were screening for lots of more conditions, it would overburden, um, you know, even further uh, what's already an overburdened and underfunded newborn screening system. We know that it's not as accurate as tandem mass spec for uh, detecting inborn errors of metabolism um, uh, based on some studies um, that we did, as well as what was done in California. Um, through a large scale study, we really need to figure out which variants in the genes are pathogenic and which are benign. Um, and then when we think about, you know, how what our current process is like for deciding which conditions should be added, um, how are we going to do this on a high throughput basis? We also don't really know the penetrance of conditions if we're diagnosing them on the basis of uh, the genetic findings. Um, you know, some of those patients may never develop the actual condition. And there's been criticism that we're really, um, you know, having what are called patients in waiting. So those who may never be affected, or we can't really t t tell them precisely if they'll uh, be affected or at what age a child might be affected with the condition. And we have to be very careful about doing this in setting a high bar. Um, we want to make sure that we're not reporting out variants of uncertain significance. Um, we need to be as um, you know high, high validity and high specificity when we're utilizing genomic sequencing. And then um, we may be limited, you know, for these cancer predisposition syndromes, for example, there's not a secondary test that we have available to really confirm the beyond the genetic findings. Um, just briefly, in um, our study from a few years ago, where we looked at the utility of sequencing for newborn screening, um, we looked at a total of 822 gene disease pairs, and we found that there were 466 that really met criteria being early onset and actionable. So steps could be taken to alleviate or modify the condition. So what we call the NGS-NBS panel. So potentially there are a lot of genes in this, in this category. Um, we definitely need more research. Uh, we need more professional guidelines about using the technology. Uh, we need specific guidelines about how to um, follow these children if they you know, are found to have one of these genetic conditions. Um, there's been a lot written about the negative of aspects of doing this um, and said that um, there's really more commentaries and reviews on the uh, impact of genetic testing than there have really been empirical research studies in this area. And then um, there's been discussion about maybe we shouldn't just do this in the newborn period, perhaps it should be done later on. Um, and later, like follow-up visits, um, should we store all the data and then query it as needed versus a resequencing a patient? Um, also, there's been concern about some of the privacy protections with, um, with this data. So, um, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, keeping up with the volume um, is something that we need to address. And uh, we definitely need more follow-up or pilot studies to gather evidence um, for doing this, which is a challenge. We have a lack of data. Um, we require data in order to consider the screening and treatment efficacy, but we can't do population screening in most states unless a condition is already on the RUSP. And if we do it on a research basis, this requires informed consent, which slows down the process. It also you know, severely decreases the number of uh, patients who can be included um, just because of the lengthy process of obtaining consent from parents. Um, and then uh, this all results in fewer pre-symptomatic patients identified for some of these drug treatment trials. Uh, so these are, are some of the challenges that are being addressed now. And then what about the incidental or secondary findings? If we sequence a whole genome, um, we'll find things like adult onset conditions like colon cancer, breast cancer risk. We'll um, consider um, you know, conditions that potentially don't have treatment like Huntington's disease. Should these things be reported back? We typically don't sit test children for adult onset conditions, especially those that aren't treated. And we have to balance the rights of parents to have this information, but also the child's autonomy and their right not to know this information. Um, but my opinion is that we can overcome a lot of these by using specific gene panels. So we'd only look at the genes that we're really interested in looking at and not um, looking at all of them. 
So currently, um, state labs are doing uh, single gene uh, genotyping, so looking at common mutations. As I said, some are doing uh, sequencing um, of uh, whole genes. And then on a research basis, sequencing panels of genes is now being done, I think, in the new, near future. And I know that there are pilots being done on looking at sequencing of uh, genes that fall into the criteria of those um, conditions that should be included in newborn screening. Um, doing whole genomes or exomes uh, remains to be seen if that will be happening in the future. So we've identified um, new conditions, uh, new treatments are being developed, new screening methods. It's definitely an extremely exciting time in this field. Um, however, uh, we need to keep calm and we need to first do no harm uh, as we proceed. So September is Newborn Screening Awareness Month. Um, and so uh, good that we're all thinking about this now, um, but continue to be interested and involved in it in the future. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Powell. And, and you can um, either raise your hand or you can put questions in the chat box and I'll look there. Um, and I'll point out that the CME CEU link will also be in the chat box for anyone who wants to, to claim credit. Um, so thank you, Dr. Powell, for a wonderful um, overview. So much stuff there. It was really incredible. For, for those of you who are relatively new to the Department of PH, you should know that Dr. Rodney Howell, whom Dr. Powell mentioned several times, um, in some ways is considered the father of modern newborn screening because he was the driving force behind um, creating the RUSP and was the first chair that, that, uh, that Cindy now, uh, now holds um, in running our advisory committee. So there's a lot of history here in, at Miami for, for newborn screening. And I'd like to thank him for being such a wonderful role model over the years and also a great mentor and um, was certainly very welcoming to me and uh, when I assumed the chair position. So, so Dr. Powell, I'll, I'll start with the first question. I know there are, there are a bunch out there. Um, it, the first one is, you mentioned that pediatricians, right, are often the first line. You get these results and we often, it's a condition we've never heard of or maybe you heard about in medical school or something else. What, what do you suggest we do when we get a positive newborn screen? Does it mean the child has the condition? What does that mean exactly? Right. I think um, it definitely doesn't mean that the child's necessarily affected. Um, the state lab often gives you some indication of that. You know, it's this a, a truly critical value um, where it looks like most likely this child is affected, or is it one of these borderlines that come back more often and, and just require that an, an additional blood spot card be sent into the state lab? But either case, those are critical. Um, the parents, as I said, need to be given some basic information, and it's easy to get like a quick one-page information sheet that you know tells you exactly what what you should be telling the parents what you need to do next. And, um, you know, in all states, there are places where, you know, the expertise is available and we'll be able to follow up with that family um, very quickly. So one of the things you mentioned was um, how newborn screening might be used for conditions that don't have an obvious treatment. Um, and I'm going to put together a couple of recent studies and, and ask for your opinion on it. One was a study that just came out showing that treatment for autism before a child shows many signs, um, this just came out two weeks ago, shows improvement in that child's outcome for autism. And this coming Monday, um, the Simons Foundation is hosting a conference on genomic screening for autism. So there are probably what, 15 mm -hmm. genes that may or may not be linked to autism. And so if you put those things together, you might imagine newborn genomic screening for autism to lead to early intervention through parents is that something that's completely crazy or, or do you imagine that being a possibility in the future? I definitely think it's a possibility. We've had a longstanding interest here um, uh, in large part due to Don Bailey, uh, someone who I collaborate with a lot on, on projects. Um, and he uh, has always been interested in Fragile X syndrome. So one of the first pilot newborn screening uh, studies we had here was on uh, Fragile X newborn screening. The thought being, just as you said, um, that you know there's benefits in picking this up early. Um, we, we now have a group of infants who were picked up through newborn screening that are getting very intensive interventions. So beyond what our state offers for our you know, early infant intervention types of programs, which are often like you know, an hour a week or so, this is very intensive to see if there can be changes in those, uh, the outcomes of those children. And I think, you know, the other thing we've 
thought a lot about was, um, you know, there's benefits beyond sort of what traditional treatment is. So it may not be just a drug treatment, but it also could be things like early intervention, additional therapies, as well as, um, you know, benefits that might be, you know, just ending the diagnostic odyssey. You know, a lot of families of children with developmental disabilities, they go from, you know, one specialist to the other for years and never really getting an answer. So if we could avoid that um, and get an earlier diagnosis, it can also be very valuable, even if there really isn't a, a true intervention in the traditional sense. And if I may add something, hi, Cindy. Hi. Um, in terms of that, it's also for family planning. Uh, for Fragile X, studies show that half of the families have a second child before they get the first child diagnosed. So family planning is another area that, yes, um, you know. Thanks for pointing that out, very true. And the other, the other point um, to your question before, Dr. Brosco, is that here we have one of the referral centers. So if you ever have any question about a newborn screening, just give us a call. Yeah, so introduce yourself, Dr. Barbuth. So everyone- Oh, so I'm sorry. I'm Dr. Barbuth and I know there's Dr. Thurston is here too, and maybe Stephanie. So we have, um, I'm a clinical geneticist and I work with Cindy in, in one of the, uh, groups. I uh, did pediatrics many years ago uh, in the same place as most of you residents. And um, we have one of the three referral centers in the state of Florida. So we take care of all the metabolic children. And now we have SMA, but also we have MPS1 and Pompe that were added into our panel last year. Um, so we take care of those children. Thank you, Dr. Babu. So we really have a really strong team here, including metabolic dietitians, um, genetic, clinical geneticists. So we have a whole range of things here at the University of Miami associated with the Mellon Center. And I see Dr. Armstrong has his hand raised. Hi, right, Cynthia. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, uh, so much. One, one of the questions I ask uh, uh, frequently, and we'd appreciate your, your thoughts on where we are today. We've seen in some of the, um, some of the, the early conditions that, that were involved in newborn screening and sickle cell is, is really the example that I will think about most often, that the, the ability to do early detection um, actually translated into the cooperative study of sickle cell disease out of NHLBI, which was a you know, 10 to 15 year natural history study that moved the field more than anything else. And, and so many of the conditions that you have talked about today have a very strong developmental trajectory component. Um, do, do you see opportunities um, and do you see significant barriers to being able to use these new tests, particularly the, the sequencing opportunities to then be able to do some of the seminal natural history studies that allow us to develop um, more effective early interventions and perhaps even developmental periods for targeted therapies? Yes, I think, um, you know, that's uh, definitely a, a wonderful opportunity. It is a challenge. Um, we have not traditionally done a very good job about tracking patients um, identified uh, through newborn screening. Um, it's left up to individual states. Um, California is one that tracks kids until they're about five years old, but you know we really need much better ways of tracking them. Uh, for some of these newer conditions, uh, the pharmaceutical companies are doing the tracking with their uh, registries and databases. Um, some parent support organizations are doing it. I mean, it is a goldmine of information, potentially, if we get that information. Um, you know, There's very little known about the natural history, especially with some of the milder conditions. And I think if you know, genomic sequencing is used Used and we only know that, oh, this child has a pathogenic change in a gene, you know, it's going to be critical that we, you know, find out what is the natural history for this condition. So yeah, there's great opportunities, um, a need for more research, a need for funding of those, you know, registries, ideally at the federal level, because I think it's too expensive for individual states to do that. But yes, thank you for bringing up that point. So, so Dr. Powell, let me ask you a policy question. And that is that if, I've, it's often been said that newborn screening is really an anomaly. It's a unique aspect of medicine in America. Almost everything else that happens in clinical practice and policy is almost random, right? It depends on your insurance and depends on where you live and everything else. And in newborn screening, we have a system that there's an evidence review and an expert panel that looks at whether we should do something or not. 
And then as it goes through your committee, it then becomes really practice state law and pretty much everywhere in the country. It's a really extraordinarily evidence-based approach to changing clinical practice. Um, the issue I think you've thought about a lot is if there's four or 500 conditions on the horizon that have some treatment and can be discovered, and it takes nine months to take care of one evidence review and decision-making, how are you going to get 400 or 500 conditions through that nine-month process in a reasonable time? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think um, what's going to happen is already happening that, you know, there are some uh, companies that are starting to offer expanded genomic newborn screening directly to families. I worry a lot, you know, certainly um, the, you know, equities, health um, equities and, uh, you know, was really who's going to be able to access that are people who can pay for it. And that's one of the benefits, right, of and why, you know, the newborn screening program and system is so effective is that it, you know, reaches pretty much everybody, regardless of their ability to pay. But I think that may be what's going to be needed to kind of move this along in a higher throughput way that, you know, similar to what, you know, tandem mass spec in some respects, there was a company that offered the testing back in the 1990s where, you know, grandparents would buy this expanded screen using tandem mass spec like for their grandchildren after they were born. So I think it may be something similar. I don't really, I'm not thrilled with that, but I think, you know, it may be one of the few options. There's also some, uh, you know, programs that are going on in um, full disclosure. I'm involved in one here in North Carolina, the early check program where it's voluntary expanded newborn screening that we're offering to families now. Um, every child born in the state, their parents receive a letter or they can enroll um, prenatally. And, um, you know, we're currently only screening for a couple of conditions at the moment, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and fragile X syndrome. Um, but we do hope to expand it to additional conditions through a, a gene panel, uh, hopefully in the near future. And then there's also the, um, the uh, screening program that is being done in New York State that's also doing it on a research basis, but offering expanded screening to babies born in a, several hospitals in, in New York State. So I think all those things are helpful. It's been hard to get funding for a lot of these, you know, uh, sequencing programs through the NIH. Um, they didn't sort of have a second round of this Ensight project that was our um, Nexus project um, that was disappointing. Um, hopefully, you know, there'll be more funding for these to be done on um, a research basis. But I, but I tend to think that, you know, we will see some direct to consumer testing and um, other methods offered by commercial laboratories. Well, thank you very much. I'm on a one person crusade to try to end meetings at least a few minutes before the hour so that folks have a chance to be human for a couple of minutes. <laughs> I will say that as, as we're ending, picking up on your theme of equity and how important that is for all of the work that we do, the specific example, if you look at newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency in California, in the years before newborn screening was universally available, 80% of the children who got a bone marrow transplant, which was curative, were white non-Hispanic infants. Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh, this must be a genetic condition because it's mostly in white non-Hispanic kids. And then in the two years after universal newborn screening was available to every baby born in California, 80% of those bone marrow transplants were done in black, Hispanic, and Asian babies. Wow. This gives you a really concrete example of how extraordinarily important it is to have universal access to healthcare, and in this case, newborn screening. Well, I wanna thank you again, Dr. Powell, for joining us. It's been a really wonderful discussion and, and, and talk. And, we appreciate your taking the time to be with us. I'm gonna remind our audience that the CME link is right there if you wanna fill it out, and that we will be hosting Dr. Manny Jimenez on October 22nd at 8 a.m., that's a Friday, and we will hope to do it in person. We'll see what COVID allows. So I'm sorry you can't hear us clapping, Dr. Powell, but we are all really appreciative of your coming here. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye.